wanted to start with a question about one of the most obvious uh, aspects of UBC this term, and that has been the construction on campus. And uh, I wanted to read to you from a New York Times article on the topic. Uh, quote, some colleges and universities have also borrowed heavily, spending money on vast expansions and amenities aimed at luring better students. Spending on instruction has grown at a much slower pace, studies have shown. Students end up covering some, if not most, of the debt payments in the form of higher tuition, room and board, and special assessments, while in some instances, state taxpayers pick up the costs. Given that UBC's current building boom is underfunded, should students or taxpayers be worried about being on the hook? No, not at all. And uh, this is one of those cases where it's really important to understand the differences between the United States and Canada. Uh, so first off, uh, we're still receiving roughly 36% of our budget directly from the provincial government. In most uh, public universities in the states, so-called public universities, they're receiving less than 10% of their budget from the state in which they're located. So that changes the dynamic a lot. And in fact, most of our buildings are not uh, underfunded. Uh, most of them, by the time we are actually building them, are uh, about 95%, I think that's the latest statistic, 95% funded. And that's a combination of public funding uh, and or uh, philanthropic giving. That's for academic buildings. It's different, of course, for, uh, say, student residences, because there we are borrowing uh, in order to uh, fund the student residences, but it's important to remember that we're borrowing up from ourselves. So we're not borrowing in the debt markets like a lot of these uh, U.S. institutions. The Board of Governors a few years ago made the determination that it was going to invest a lot of uh, new money coming into the endowment from development on the South Campus into the Student Housing Endowment Fund. And that means UBC can borrow its own money uh, to uh, pay for uh, these kinds of improvements. So at the end of the day, we're not uh, in debt. Uh, we, I think we would spend roughly, I think we're at about 1.5% of our operating budget goes into debt financing, uh, and it won't uh, grow to about more than 1.7%, even with everything that's planned over the next uh, three to four years. On that same topic, uh, there was an AMS survey that came out last summer that found that the majority of students disagreed with the statement, uh, campus is mainly being developed with student needs in mind. Uh, what do you say to students who have had issues with this latest round of construction and maybe think they're not the target of this Well, I can only say that the buildings that we've built are all either student residences or academic buildings. So if students aren't the target, I don't know who is. The de facto control of municipal government at UBC has been passed around the provincial government for years now. No one seems to know what's going on out in Point Grey. Uh, given this inaction, do you think it's time for UBC to take the lead on local governance reform? Well, we, we're in a somewhat complicated position because, as you have indicated, uh, local governance is within the purview of uh, the province. And you may know that uh, about a year ago, two years ago now actually, uh, we had uh, a group of uh, deputy ministers who came around. They interviewed students, staff, faculty. They asked whether or not this was a high priority for people uh, and people who are living on campus. They asked them if it was a high priority local governance. And interestingly, it emerged in their work, this had nothing to do with the uh, university, uh, that it wasn't a particularly high priority. So it may be for some people, doesn't seem to be for the majority of people. And then the government uh, essentially said, look, we're not going to make this a priority because there doesn't seem to be anything fundamentally broken here. And frankly, opening up local governance from the province's perspective could be opening up some very complicated situations, not really so much about UBC, but also about the uh, role of the endowment lands, uh, which as you know are really separate from the university. And so I guess there's a certain element of just not wanting to get involved in that from the provincial uh, perspective. And the university doesn't have authority uh, within the framework of the legislation to do anything on its own. Having said that, I do think it's important that we ask ourselves questions about what the future of governance will be on the campus, and that is something that the Board of Governors uh, looks at quite regularly.
do you think the current system is broken? As you said, the profit slate doesn't believe really No, I don't think it is. I, you know, can things be improved? Probably. Uh, but I don't think it's fundamentally broken. Uh, you know, all of the land governance is now clarified, at least. It was more confused before, so we at least know what the governance structures are. And uh, when one does uh, most of the public hearings, etc., on any changes, the response is actually relatively restrained in terms of the number of people who get involved and the actual um, evaluation that one gets from those public hearings is actually quite positive on balance. UBC was recently forced to make an about face on tuition for a new Bachelor of International Economics degree from the Vancouver School of Economics. How do you respond to the complaints that programs like the BIE are creating a two-tiered education system? Well, first off, I challenge the uh, characterization. I'm not sure it was an about face. What happened was, as you know, that there was some uh, student uh, concern about the tuition level that was being projected. And then there was some discussion between uh, the university, student government, leadership, and the tuition was lessened. But it is still a differential tuition from the tuition that uh, is charged for uh, regular programs. You know, I don't see these as two tiers. This is just a different program. Uh, the, the important point here is that uh, there's a commitment made to ensure that uh, everyone who applies to the program is fully eligible for uh, student financial assistance. And that, to me, was absolutely the key in making a program like this work. It can't just be a program that's available only to students who happen to have the resources to support it themselves. But the fact that uh, students will be eligible for the full range of uh, student financial assistance means that this will be, I hope, a very exciting program that remains accessible. You said that uh, it was a different program, not so much as a second tier of a uh, right. regular degree, but wouldn't students be kind of, uh, wouldn't part of the selling point of a degree be that uh, ostensibly it would be worth more than a BA? Isn't that kind of a second tier? Uh, well, I don't think that we've made the argument that it's worth more. We've made the argument that it will be an enhanced experience uh, because there are uh, opportunities because of the funding for the program that will allow students to have access to certain opportunities that students in other programs won't have, but frankly that's true all across the university depending on the structure of a program. UBC is also pursuing Bridge to UBC, a program that would allow students who fall short of entrance requirements to gain admittance through study at an affiliated college. Given that the concern around uh, entrance requirements often relates to English proficiency, are you concerned that this will add to cultural division at UBC? I actually see it in exactly the opposite perspective. I think it's actually designed to try to make sure that there's less lumpiness in that intercultural existence, which I agree with you is hugely important at the university. So first off, this is a very different program from uh, Vancouver School of Economics and the uh, Bachelor of International Economics. This is a program which is in a sense a kind of qualifying year or conditional admission. Uh, for students and it's focused entirely around two things. One is, as you say, language uh, and trying to help students who are outstanding but whose language skills may not quite be up to the mark to actually gain academic language experience, not just English as a second language. And there's a lot of research, including research done at UBC, we're actually trying to learn from uh, what we know, given the research that's done, that tells us that students are much more likely to succeed if they have an opportunity to really work on academic language, not just general usage language. So that's point one, and the program will enable that. The second piece is that we are actually trying to ensure a greater diversity of students coming to UBC from other parts of the world. So to, to date, a lot of the recruitment to UBC has come from uh, international baccalaureate programs and international schools. Well, if you want to talk about uh, schools that are more likely to have kids that have uh, extra wealth, etc., that's where you're going to find them. What we're actually trying to do is say, we want to find uh, students who come from what you might call indigenous schools, uh, native language schools, who happen to be outstanding but may not have had the same opportunity uh, to be acculturated in Western style education. And so that's another reason to try to give them a year to sort of get up to speed on the expectations uh, that exist in a university like UBC 
and uh, therefore to allow them to be more successful and I think to actually be better integrated into the overall student body. But would UBC be pursuing things like the Bachelor of International Economics or, or Bridge if they didn't need money? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think the BIE is just an exciting program. I think the idea of having a cohort uh, which is half international, half uh, Canadian, uh, looking at international uh, economics makes a lot of sense. My own daughter goes to a program at the University of Edinburgh which is structured in a similar way. It happens to be an international relations program but it means you're bringing together two groups, domestic students, international students, in an enhanced program that's pretty intellectually exciting. So I think it's just a good thing to do. The bridge, I would say even more so. I, it, this is not, and I, I know it's hard for people to believe uh, because we're always talking about university finances. But the real reason to do the bridge is to have a wider variety of students who can succeed coming from a wider variety of countries. I actually think that's an advantage for all UBC students because it makes the classroom experience more exciting. I wanted to talk a bit about the upcoming provincial election, which may be coming sooner than we thought, apparently. Uh, I want to go through what BC universities are asking for this time around. The Research Universities Council of BC have asked the province for $130 million over four years to create more spaces for students, uh, $51 million each year for new scholarships and grants for industry-ready research. And they've argued this is necessary because over the next uh, four years, we're going to need 11,000 new university seats for uh, students to fill the demand. Um, First off, why should taxpayers be kicking more money to universities? And, and you left out one uh, the third request, which is for enhanced student, student aid, uh, aid. Yeah. Um, which I think is very important and actually is an area where BC is not performing to the level that it needs to. Uh, why should taxpayers invest? Well, BC currently has uh, one of the lowest uh, provincial higher education attainment rates in Canada. So if you actually look across the country, uh, BC ranks either 7th or 8th, depending on the year, in the number of students graduating with undergraduate degrees. For an advanced economy uh, and a province that has strong international ambitions, that just isn't good enough. And the reason for that is we actually don't have enough spaces. Every one of the last, uh, I think, 10 years, UBC has over-enrolled uh, compared to what we're funded for. And that's true for many of the other research universities in uh, British Columbia. So we currently have more students than we're paid to have at the undergraduate level. And we also know that the uh, entry averages across the province have risen. And I was just with the uh, president of Simon Fraser uh, earlier today and we were talking about this. Whereas, you know, it was possible to get into a university in British Columbia with, say, a 75, 78 percent average a decade ago, that's almost impossible now, at least at the research intensive universities. So it's harder to get in. And what we're seeing in places like Surrey is loads of students who want to go to university who find they don't have access to spaces. So that's the basic proposition. And then from a UBC perspective, we're also concerned that there's a dramatic underfunding of graduate student spaces. Uh, it's very hard for people to believe, but we currently have roughly 1,300 graduate students at UBC who attract no funding, no provincial funding. And we think that that's just not reasonable uh, if you want to have successful research intensive universities. And so we made a decision many years ago, this goes back a long way, uh, that we had to admit more graduate students because that's what makes a research intensive university. And we would love to obviously be able to accept more, but to have them properly funded. And on the research front, uh, there's a wonderful study that was done about three years ago suggesting that UBC alone is responsible for roughly $10 billion in, of economic activity in British Columbia. And a large part of that comes from the research activities of the university. Not just spin-off companies, but products, ideas, approaches that are adopted by industry or by business and that actually enhance productivity, etc. So it seems to me to be a really good, good investment for the people of BC.
the current government seems opposed to this kind of spending, saying that universities aren't preparing students for the direction the BC economy is headed. And uh, they've argued that the future is in trade schools. Uh, is that division useful? No, uh, I think it's wrong to create an either-or situation here. I am totally supportive of uh, the need to improve trades education across Canada. We've done a bad job with that in our country, generally speaking. But uh, if you actually look at the BC government's own statistics, by 2016, we know that there will be a very significant uh, undersupply of graduates for the labor force and it goes across all areas. It's right from trades education through to uh, PhDs. So we keep encouraging the government not to separate out the trades and think that's the only place where there has to be investment, but to look at the whole range and see that the government really has to plan to ensure that we have the people for the jobs uh, that are going to be created between now and you know 2050. What would a change in government look like for UBC? Very hard to predict. Um, you know, the, uh, the official opposition has uh, promised certain things that I think are very positive. Uh, the promises around uh, support for students uh, through grants uh, are good. That's a good thing. Um, there's been very little said, really, about uh, advanced education in either campaign so far. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether there's more said uh, between now and uh, when the uh, election's actually held. But truthfully, I think it's hard to predict what either party will do because they haven't said very much. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? I mean, you see a lot of news stories about... Uh the troubles this generation are having and the way that universities are failing, but no one's talking about it in the provincial election, really. Yeah, I think uh, part of the issue is it's uh, a period of some economic downturn, and so the preoccupation is jobs. And um, sometimes I think politicians think of that set of issues in too narrow a fashion. They're not connecting the jobs piece to the broader range of investment in education that's required. So it's not unusual. I don't blame British Columbia as politicians particularly. This is a fairly common phenomenon in most of West, the Western world. Education and universities tend not to be major topics during elections. Uh, you've mentioned in there uh, about the, the difficulty of getting into a research-intensive university in British Columbia, and uh, UBC recently instituted broad-based admissions to try to lower entrance averages and reduce the emphasis on uh, just getting the grade. Do you think that's been a success so far? Uh, not a big enough success. Uh, I think that the, you know, we've only got really one year of data, but uh, at least in terms of making the university more accessible, not purely on the basis of grades. There are high differentials amongst different programs, but we still have a number of programs where even with broad-based admission, the entrance requirements are so high as to be, in my view, worrisome, because I'm not sure how real uh, the distinctions are between 89 and 91 or 90 and 93. Uh, having said that, I do think that I'm, I'm already hearing from uh, profs and first-year teachers uh, a sense of encouragement around the kinds of conversations that are taking place in classrooms. So to the extent that broad-based admissions has actually tried to target people who are more likely to want to be engaged, to participate, uh, to make their own university experience vibrant, I think we're seeing some evidence that that's happening, but obviously we need more data. I have here an article from a 1977 Harvard Crimson, uh, oh. which uh, uh, concerns a, a play, uh, Hedda Gabler. Um, Hedda Gabler. Gabler, mm -hmm. Gabler. Mm -hmm. um, there, By is a, there is a Stephen Toop in here whose uh, who's performance as Eilert Lovborg, Lovborg yeah. yes, is, uh, is, is Hand. Hand, exactly. Yes. Is this, this is you, This is me, okay, absolutely. Was, you Very it. unfair critic, though, of course. <laughs> it was, yeah, quite brutal. Um, can you talk a bit about, you You seem to have been involved in several dramatic productions. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? 
Well, I actually, despite the review, uh, I actually considered uh, theater as a career for uh, quite a few years. Uh, I did. I started theater in high school and uh, continued all through university. Had wonderful opportunities to work with really uh, major directors from New York, from London, on various productions, some of which were, I think, pretty hard to watch. Uh, I was in a, a production of War and Peace, which was probably for the actors one of the most fun things you could imagine doing. It had all sorts of spinning stages, and it, I mean, it was a bit like being in Anna Karenina on film. But um, I suspect to watch was pretty difficult because it went on for about three hours and it was uh, pretty tough. But I, I've always loved theater and I still do. I don't uh, have an opportunity to act anymore except in role of president where I get to act a fair amount. And uh, I also uh, love going to theater and I, I still do that a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you think things would have ended up differently if this got a glowing review or? No. <laughs> You can't, you can't pay attention to single reviews. I did get some good ones, too. <laughs> yes, this might be true. Um, got another one here. Um, uh, UBC students are filming a Harlem Shake video in uh, Kerner Plaza today. Are you aware of the, the phenomena? Yeah. No, I don't. You're not aware of the Harlem nope. Shake? Okay, well, you're probably better off for that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, what's been your favorite um, student-produced viral video during your time at UBC? Oh, it's a good question. Um, well, I still think the, the big production number uh, with the helicopters and uh, people in the pools and all of that, was it was just a lot of fun to watch. And it, and it really went viral in a pretty big way. Uh, and, it, it, and the reason it was really fun is it's one of the videos that definitely caught people's attention. I was actually getting calls from uh, various university presidents and others about that uh, about that video in Canada and outside of the country. So, in fact, I, I've used it as an example <laughs> sometimes of, of how communications about a university may be much more compelling and much more effective if it's spontaneous and actually comes from students rather than is planned by a communications department. Would you ever consider getting on Twitter in your capacity as UBC president? No, I was asked that actually at a at a um, AMS council meeting once, and uh, I have a very clear answer on that one. I I despise Twitter, uh, truthfully. Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of the worst things that's been created in my lifetime, and so there's no way that I'm going to go on it. I di I dislike everything about it. I I think that the the notion of the immediate reaction to something without any reflection, the idea that you can say anything that really matters in the limited number of characters that you're given, and that you have to do it immediately, and that everyone else will then respond immediately with no reflection, I think it's the worst of our society. So no. All right, that was a very firm answer. <laughs> Sorry. Where do you see UBC in the next 10 years? Well, I think what I'd like to talk about there is, is uh, teaching and learning, uh, because I think anyone who pays attention to what's going on in the world around us will see that there are dramatic shifts taking place. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that no one knows exactly where they're going. By that I mean, uh, how do we understand the way students actually deal with their own education today? I think it's changing. I don't think it's exactly the same as it was 25 years ago. I think the uh, technology-enabled opportunities are completely different than they were five years ago. Uh, people talk about the role of MOOCs. I think they're a bit overstated, but that's only part of a, a general trend, which is that we're going to have to look really carefully at how we deliver what we think of as courses. They're not so much about, I think, provision of information and data anymore. Uh, I think the role of the professor is going to be shifting. I've been talking about this a lot to colleagues across the university. So I see 10 years from now uh, that UBC, I hope, will have been a really uh, careful, thoughtful, but aggressive mover uh, on all of the new technologies and understanding how they affect classroom and outside of classroom learning.